And there are some positive laws that are more or less arbitrary, although arbitrary is probably not the best word. And there are some laws that are explications or you might say specifications of the natural law. So exactly the third commandment is an example of that kind of positive law. Another example of that, because we don't just have divine positive law, we have ecclesiastical positive law, this would be like canon law, for example, and then we have civil positive law, secular positive law, okay? We have family positive law, you know, father establishing a bedtime, or whatever that might be, that's positive law. And very often, positive law specifies the natural law. So for example, we know by the natural law that we shouldn't murder one another. I hope everybody here has figured that one out, right? So we shouldn't just stab each other in dark alleyways. Um, uh, but that's not all when it comes to the respect of the life of another. We also have to not negligently put other people's lives in danger. That certainly follows. You know, so somebody that decided that he was going to do target practice during my talk, right, that's really bad. Okay, because there's a ton of people in between him and, and you know, whatever, wherever the target would be. Um, so what follows from that? Well, we can get even more concrete. So when we drive, we have an obligation in justice to drive in a reasonable manner. And what follows from that, that you know, we should not uh, drive some kind of excessive speed, right? And what follows from that? Well, once you get to that point, everybody kind of has to figure it out for himself. And an 18-year-old is going to think that on the highway going 90, 95 miles an hour, is perfectly safe because he's got lightning fast reflexes. You know, he's tested on these like 180 milliseconds, and he feels totally comfortable. And then, you know, 90-year-old woman that can't see over the steering wheel. You know, she's going 35 miles an hour, and she feels like she's, you know, screaming fast and putting everybody in danger. And maybe she is. <laughs> So, authority has to specify the natural law in situations like this and say, look, 70 miles an hour or 65 miles an hour, whatever it is, this is the speed that's appropriate on this particular part of the highway. And we're going to find that that's, that's the most common use of positive law. Now, another example of positive law, which I call being arbitrary, again, that's not the best word for it, but you'll see divine positive law that's not found in the natural law, in the Old Testament in particular. So, for example, in the Old Testament, the Jews were forbidden from eating certain uh, dietary things. They were uh, instructed to uh, have certain feast days. They were instructed to practice circumcision. They, you know, all these things that have nothing to do with the natural law, and yet God instructed them to do it anyway. Okay? And if somebody had broken one of those laws, it would not have been any sin except the sin of disobedience to God. So a positive law that is not an explication of the natural law. And the reason I said that arbitrary is not really the best word is because it's not like God was just passing laws for the fun of it. So these laws, each one of them, each their own unique way, was given to the people of God in order to prepare them in one way or another for the new covenant. Um, now, many Jews rejected the new covenant, but it's not because they were not prepared. Okay, so this is what we mean when we talk about the law. And the question comes, and it is a big controversy between Catholics and Protestants, is to what degree 
is the law binding on Christians, on the baptized, on those that are following Christ. And unfortunately, many Protestants will try to argue that the law is not binding at all, not even the natural law. So they'll say things like, once you're saved, you're always saved. And so no matter what you do, it doesn't matter. You can't lose your salvation. Because the law is no longer binding on you. And the reason that they come to that conclusion is because they're drawing very selectively from certain passages of the New Testament and unfortunately ignoring other passages, sometimes passages that are even very, very close to one another. Now, I want to, it's a good opportunity to, to talk about some of the issues that surrounded the church during the promulgation of the letters of the New Testament. Because we're going to find that there's two major heresies that those letters are addressing. The latter heresy, which you're going to find in the letters of St. John, for example, you're going to find in some of the very late letters of St. Paul. So St. Paul was beheaded in about 66, 67 AD, so just before the destruction of Jerusalem. And in the mid-60s, some of his captivity letters, as he's in house arrest in Rome, he's starting to shift his focus away from this first heresy and towards the second heresy. And that second heresy that those particular letters deal with is called Gnosticism. Sometimes you hear it called Docetism. And Gnosticism was a Christian heresy that arose from a contact of the gospel with some Greek ideas and some Persian ideas. And the most basic tenet of that heresy was that there were actually two gods. That there was a good god and then there was an evil god. Now metaphysically this is impossible. To have an evil god in the first place or to have two gods is both impossible. But they were not very good philosophers. So, good God and an evil God. And they said that the good God was the creator of everything spiritual. And therefore, everything spiritual was good. And the evil God was the creator of everything material. And therefore, everything material was evil. And they said that human beings were spiritual beings in the first place that committed some sin and therefore became entrapped in the material world and stuck and imprisoned in a you know, horrible, ugly, fleshly body. And the goal of the Gnostic was to accumulate secret knowledge, which in Greek is Gnosis, and that's where the name of the heresy comes from, which would help them to basically unlock the prison of their body and escape. And indeed, the, the great sacrament of the Gnostics was suicide. It's a really kind of very, very dark, dark religion. So the epitome, the highest act of the Gnostics was to starve themselves to death. And they were very uh, kind and helpful to one another. So if you were trying to starve yourself to death, then a lot of the elite of the Gnostics would keep vigil with you as you were killing yourself. And the reason for that was not to comfort you or console you or try to get you to stop or anything like that. It was if you lost your nerve and said, forget it, I didn't change my mind, then they would take a pillow and they would, they would just put it on your face until you were dead. Okay? So these were the Gnostics. Now, because the Gnostics said everything material was evil, what followed from that was that Christ would not have had a body. Christ could not have had a body. Because if Christ had had a body, he would have been partially evil. And since Christ was good, he could not have been partially evil, and therefore he could not have had a body. It was a terrible sort of history, and it, uh, heresy, and it affected church had to fight it for about 200 years. And then even after it was stamped out, it came 
back to the time of Augustine, for example, and Manichaeanism. It came back even earlier than that in various forms. So uh, you see kind of some, some similar heresies that are following from the same principles. There's a heresy in the fourth century where, okay, God is, is you know, spiritual and yeah, we don't want to be Arians and deny the, the incarnation, but Christ couldn't have had a soul. You know, it's basically just the divine spirit driving around a biological machine. Okay, well, that's really problem, problematic, because then Christ couldn't have suffered, because it's the soul that suffers through the body. Right? Uh, but again, it was just this uncomfortableness with the divinity really being united to a body, to a true human body. We see it again with the Quietists in the 16th century. They acknowledge the Incarnation, they acknowledge the union of the human and the divine, but they always wanted to, as far as possible, exclude the humanity of Christ. And they said, this is actually a stumbling block to your spiritual life. And if you want to see St. Teresa of Avila get really, really angry, look up what she writes about the Quietists. Because, of course, you have tremendous devotion to our Lord's humanity, which is a bridge for us to our Lord's divinity. So this was the second great heresy that, that we're going to find in the New Testament. But the greater part of the letters of the New Testament are actually not aimed against this heresy, which comes later in time. The greater part is going to be aimed against the heresy that we typically call Judaizing. And the Judaizers were men, typically Pharisees, that would follow in the path of the Apostles. And they were, they were quite clever, so they would wait for St. Paul, for example, to leave the city. And then they would come in in his wake and they would say, we are also Apostles of Christ, and we're here to complete the Catechism. And what St. Paul didn't have time for you to do, and then like, here is the law, and here's the you know million different ways that you have to observe the Sabbath, and here's uh, you know we need to get all people to go get get together and get people circumcised, and we need to you know reintroduce the the Jewish festival calendar, and we need to uh, you know on and on and on. Here's all the dietary laws that you need to observe. St. Paul neglected to tell you that you can't eat pork, and, you know, on and on and on. And this is what St. Paul and the other apostles are really having to struggle against in the early church, are these Pharisees that are going around saying this. And we see that they have to have a council about it, that's in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 15. And we see St. Paul writing prodigiously about it. Particularly, although you, know, you could name many letters like Galatians, others, um, but particularly Romans is one where he talks a lot about justification. And Romans is one that Protestants will often kind of turn to. And they like to think of it as their book, quote unquote. Um, and a Catholic that is not very well formed sometimes. Can read Romans and think, oh, this sounds kind of Protestant sometimes. Okay? So we want to talk about that a little bit and then make our way that all the way back into the Gospels. So in Romans, we really want to focus, you know, obviously at some point you're going to read the whole book, but for tonight's purposes, we want to focus on chapter 2 and chapter 3 of Romans. And the reason that we want to talk about chapter 2 and chapter 3 is because Paul is talking about justification in those two chapters. And not only is he talking about justification, but he introduces the distinction between the natural law and ritual law. Or in other words, those divine positive laws that were meant to prepare the people for Christ. And once Christ comes, therefore they're fulfilled and no longer necessary or binding. And the one he calls good works, natural law, and the other he calls works of the law. And 
And you'll see him shift as he talks, from talking about good works to talking about works of the law. So this is somewhat into chapter 2. Do you presume upon the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience? Do you not know that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? Well, that, that's already kind of interesting. Uh, because we often rely on God's wrath to lead us to repentance. But it's really God's kindness that's supposed to move us to repentance. To real contrition, real sorrow. Do you not know that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But by your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself. On the day of wrath, when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. And then this is, this is 2 6. For he will render to every man according to his works. It's very, very clear. To those who by patience, now this, we have to. Talk about this. To those who by patience and well doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give immortal life, eternal life. Okay? Now, what is this well doing? Well, if we look at the Greek, it's Aragon Agathon. And Aragon Agathon means works good. Okay? And the best translation of it would have just been good works. Now, this introduces a difficulty with this particular version of the Bible, although this is, for reading the Bible, my favorite version of the Bible, but no translation is ever going to be perfect. So this is the Revised Standard Version Second Catholic Mission. And as far as my understanding goes, this was originally a lost translation of the Bible. And then Catholic scholars went through it carefully, and any place that something had been translated inaccurately, on intentionally vague or inaccurate in order to support Ross's position, they corrected that. But they missed this. They left this kind of well-doing. And why is this well-doing here? Because Protestants don't want to put good works or necessary for eternal life. But the Greek is exactly what it says. If you want eternal life, you have to have good works. So he will render to every man according to his works. To those who by patience in good works seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are factious and who do not obey the truth, but obey wickedness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being, not who does not have faith, or, you know, although all these things are true. But the thing he focuses on here is every human being who does evil. The Jew first and also the Greek, the glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good works, or literally, who works good works. The Jew first and also the Greek. All who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. Okay? So this is very, very important that Paul is laying the grand groundwork here and he's telling you, look, we're going to talk about the ritual law here, but don't get confused because good works are important and the law is important when it comes to the natural law, when it comes to good works that we can know with or without the revealed law. So then, towards the end of chapter 2, he shifts and he starts talking about circumcision. And then he starts using this phrase in chapter 3, for no human being will be justified in his sight by works of the law, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. So what's going on? The doer of the law will be justified. And then all of a sudden in the next verse, he says, no one will be justified by the works of the law. Okay. The only, the only way that you can reconcile these two things is if he's alluding to two different things there. And in fact, it's quite clear that he's doing that. 
Because in the first part of chapter 3, he's, he's talking about what men can know from reason. He's talking in every, in every aspect of his language. He's talking as if he's talking about the natural law. And then suddenly he shifts and starts talking about circumcision. And for Paul, circumcision is always the sign and example of the ritual law. Like it's the most obvious and therefore a symbol for all of the ritual law. So he starts talking about circumcision, and then he shifts from talking about good works to works of the law. And then he keeps going. He starts to talk about faith. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from law, of the law, and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction since so all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, they are justified by his grace as a gift. Okay? So now he's adding a condition. Right? He's already said those who do good works are going to be justified. But now he's adding those who receive grace are going to be justified. Okay? And what we're going to find is that there's other conditions as well that he's going to get to. Through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as an expiation by his blood, to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because of his divine forbearance. He had passed over former sins. It was to prove the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies him who has faith in Jesus. So now he's adding another condition, saying also you need faith. And we're going to see this very consistently through the Gospels, through the other letters, through Hebrews, that yes, you need faith. Without faith, no one can be pleasing to God. That's Hebrews 11. But then, over and over again, also all these allusions to works. And Paul's going to say over and over again that if you are a, you know, da -da 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 all these different classes of grace sinners, since you're not going to get to heaven. So there's a complexity here that we don't want to just over reduce. And what becomes of our boasting is excluded on what principle? The principle of works? No, but on the principle of faith. For we hold that as a man is justified by faith apart from good works? No, it's what he says. Apart from works of the law. Now, Luther, when he was translating the Bible into German, he did two things with this passage. It became kind of the standard and uh, manner under which the Bible was marched. In the first place, he didn't explain the works of the law. He let people believe that that meant any kind of good works, any kind of observance of the natural law, any kind of virtuous <coughs> life. Whereas, if you read Paul carefully, no, it's clear that those things are important to him, and he must therefore be referring to the ritual law, which in fact the church has been talking about over and over, and over again, not just Paul. The other thing is that, and this is even worse, is that he added a word to this verse. So if you read this in Luther's German Bible, if you would translate that into English, it would say, For we hold that a man is justified by faith alone, apart from works of the law. That's really, really bad. That's so deceptive. That word is not in the Greek. Not in any recension of the Bible is that word in the Greek. So this is a huge problem. The word faith alone, that phrase, does appear in the scriptures, in the letter of James. And James says, man is justified by faith and not by faith, justified by works and not by faith alone. He says, show me your faith without works, and I will show you my faith with works. And he says, faith without works is dead. And it won't save you. And because that Luther called the letter of James an epistle of straw, and he actually didn't include it in the New Testament, because it didn't agree with the Gospel of Luther. So, really bad. He threw a lot of stuff out of the Bible, actually. So... Of course, they, they threw about seven books out of the Old Testament, 
which had been accepted by Christians forever. And uh, he also threw some other things out of the New Testament as well. But James is the most famous of those. Now, even when we go back to our Lord, we see that our Lord, he says, I have not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And there's a twofold meaning here. When it comes to the ritual law, he didn't come to destroy that law. He came to be the fulfillment of what that law was serving as a type for and a foreshadowing. So it's not like he came and just took an axe to the ritual law. He came and said, this is why that law existed. And now that I'm here, that law no longer serves any purpose. But it, there's a twofold meaning here, because he also, he's also meaning here that I've come not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Meaning I've come to actually give to you the means of grace that are necessary to observe the law. And then we see him over and over and over again insisting on that. Especially if you look at uh, John 13 17, what we call the last discourse of Christ. Over and over again, he says, If you love me, as he says, have faith in me? Yeah, obviously, we need that. He says that in other places. And over and over again, he says, If you love me, keep my commandments. And if we don't keep his commandments, that's a sign that we don't love him. And if we don't love him, then that's a sign that our faith is dead. So, even the devils believe, quote unquote, and tremble. Right? And another place he has a rich young man come up to him. And again, this is not getting or singular. So he's a rich young man come up to him. And the rich man, young man says, what do I have to do to obtain eternal life? And our Lord says, keep the commandments. Right? Now again, that was the beginning of a conversation that unfortunately the rich young man walked away from. You know, there is again, more to the picture. We're not justified by works apart from faith, any more than we're justified by faith apart from works. We need all of it in order to justify. So that's a long digression, but it, it's important because, you know, to the degree that this country still has vestiges of any kind of Christian heritage, it's Protestant, and you're going to come across these questions very, very frequently. Okay? When our Lord sends out in the Great Commission, He tells them to go out and to baptize. He says, make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all that I have. There's an importance, an importance to the law. All right. Now, we're going to get to the Ten Commandments, but uh, our Lord actually Himself summarizes all of the commandments under two. And the reason that He did that is because a kind of sneaky scribe came to Him and was trying to pin Him down on what the greatest commandment was. And the Pharisees at this point have a very antagonistic relationship with our Lord, and they're trying to catch him. They're trying to get him to say something that they can use against him. So they come to him and they say, hey, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment? And they're really hoping that he's going to say something like, oh, The fourth commandment is the most important. Then they can go and tell everyone, Did you hear what he said? Only the fourth commandment's important and nothing else. Who is this guy? Come with us to kill him. This is what they're trying to do. So, what does he do? He says, the greatest commandment is this, to love Almighty God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your strength. And that actually comes from the Torah, from the Old Testament. And then he says, and the second greatest law is like it to love your neighbors yourself, which also comes from the Torah, Leviticus. And then he says, all of the rest of the law depends upon these. So in a certain sense, 
All of the law is summed up in love. But remember, if you love me, keep my commandments. So we, this is also in the air that we breathe. That everyone wants to just say, well, I love God, I do what I want. So, no. No. Like, if you're punching me in the face every time you see me, and then you just say that you love me, I'm not going to believe you. Right? If you love me, stop punching me in the face. So, just because all of the law is encapsulated in love, and simply an explication of unfolding of the law of charity, it doesn't dispense us from observing that unfolding. Right? In fact, if we really love God, we should want to know as much as possible about what is pleasing to Him. Okay? Uh, not to the degree that our life begins to orbit around sin. This can be a huge, huge problem, especially for people with Anglo-Saxon culture, because we're very, very legal people. We want to know the law and we want to observe it. You know? What was I just reading? Uh, in Germany, everything is prohibited except what is permitted. In France, everything is permitted except what is prohibited. And then it said, in Russia, everything is prohibited even what is permitted. <laughs> and then it said in Italy, everything is permitted, even what is prohibited. <laughs> Someone just posted that to the priest group today. And it's true, there's different cultures. And in our culture, we're intensely legalistic. And it's really, really easy for people in the Anglo-Saxon culture to have a spirituality that, just like a planet going around the sun, it just orbits sin. And the problem with that is that, in the first place, sin is, is really only a, a symptom. You know, if we're falling into sin on a regular basis, then there is a problem with our love. You know? Okay, Lord, I, clearly, I don't love you as I ought. And that's the problem that needs to be addressed. It's like the charity of the soul and union with Christ. That has to be at the heart of our spiritual life. But Anglo-Saxon, or even people maybe that are not Anglo-Saxon, but grew up in this kind of culture, we're really good at just like treating the symptoms. And we don't want to do that. Because we'll never really make any progress forward in the spiritual life. And unfortunately, you really don't find a lot of mystics uh, in Anglo-Saxon culture. You find a lot of them in Italian, French, you know, Spanish. Uh, and I think a lot of that is, is because of that. Because Many of us get, get quite hampered um, by just revolving around sin. And it becomes very solipsistic, like inward turned. Right? So I, I said in a recent sermon that even when we're looking at our sins, we want to be looking at Christ first on the cross and only observe our sins in the, our peripheral vision. And what does that mean? It means that. Yes, we see our sins, but we see them in the context of Christ's mercy and compassion. Remember, Christ's kindness was meant to cause repentance. And that's what we want to be inspiring our sorrow for sin. And if that is inspiring our sorrow for sin, it's going to be accompanied by a great confidence. You know, the confidence of the woman who rushed into the house of Simon the Pharisee and wept at the feet of our Lord. For he took great, great compassion and kindness on him, forgave Okay. Uh, let me fly a little bit. Okay, so um, going through 96, 97, 98, 99, these are the works of mercy, both spiritual and corporal. These are concrete ways that charity is manifested. This list, so it's two pairs of seven, it's not comprehensive. But it is something that you should return to. So do read this in your own time. It is something that you should return to from time to time and really use it as an examination of conscience. 
And we're not bound to do all the works of mercy at all times and in all places and all circumstances that be possible. But if we have some of them where we say, I've never done this, ever. You know? Or maybe even worse, I haven't done any of these. That's, that's a big problem. We need to love whom God loves, and that means loving our neighbor, and that means loving not in dreams, but in a very concrete, active way. And the works of mercy can be very helpful for that. Okay, the commandments. If we'll turn to page 100. So we made it to part two today. We made it to page 100. We're flying. Okay. Uh, page 100. We have the ten commandments listed. We should memorize the ten commandments. It's not too difficult. So the first three commandments have to do directly with God, and the next seven have to do with our neighbor. And there's a certain order to things. So when you look at the first three commandments, it's the first one, worship God alone. Right? That's it. The second one is what is next most proximate to God, which is His holy name, right? His external glory in the world. And then after that, the Sabbath day, which protects and kind of guards these other two commandments. Keep thou holy the Sabbath day. And then we break into the commandments of the neighbors. So the fourth commandment is honor thy father and thy mother. Why? Because that is a kind of justice that you can never repay. Your parents have given you a gift that you can never give back to them. And so we have a very unique relationship of justice with our parents in particular. After that, thou shalt not kill or murder thy be better translation here, a shot of murder. If you destroy somebody's life, you've removed them as a subject of rights in this world. So if you if you kill somebody, you've basically taken all of his goods. Right? So that needs to be principle. Then after that we have the second sixth commandment, the shall not commit adultery. So after life, what is the next most proximate to someone, a spouse. And that sixth commandment is paired to the ninth commandment. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's life. Right? Seventh commandment is thou shalt not steal. And then the tenth commandment is paired to that. Thou shalt not covet the neighbor's goods. And then the eighth commandment, thou shalt not bear false witness. So there is kind of a certain order to the Ten Commandments that makes it much easier to remember them. Now, when we're talking about the Ten Commandments, you do want to be aware that Protestants number these differently, and you'll come across that sometimes. So, Protestants actually take the First Commandment and they split it into two, and then they take the Ninth Commandment and the Tenth Commandment and they combine them into one. Now, in principle, there's no problem with that, because in principle, those commandments are not numbered in the Old Testament. If you go to Exodus 20, I think it is, where you see them first promulgated, it's not the first commandment is this, the second commandment is this, so on. Right? Uh, so there, there could, in principle, be some question about how to divide those things. The problem is that the reason that they divide out the first commandment is not consistent with the rest of Scripture and Revelation. So they pull out, thou shalt uh, worship me alone, God alone. And then they say the second commandment is, thou shalt make no graven images. And so they turn something that's really a part of the first commandment and a part of not worshiping false gods into just an absolute prohibition against false images, or sorry, against any images of any kind. That's why you find a lot of iconoclasm Protestantism, so usually when you go into a Protestant church, unless it's like a high Anglican church or something like that, you would not divide the commandments in this way. You won't see a crucifix, you'll see just a bare cross. Why do they do that? Because you can't make a graven image. Okay? And they'll use this as like a beating stick on Catholics for images of Mary, and the angels, and the saints, and you know, on and on and on. Now, how do we make a response to that? Well, the first thing you can do, depending on who it is, is say, hey, pull out your wallet, you know? 
and see the eyes pictures of his family. Well, these days, maybe pull out your skull, maybe pictures of your family there. That's a great idea that you can get rid of. Because that's all we're doing when we have pictures of our Lord or the saints. These are just pictures of our family. Right? We don't worship them. No more than the wife of a deceased husband. Like, you know, she might have a photograph or a painting of her husband that she treasures, and she might even, you know, kiss that painting. Nobody thinks why is she worshiping that piece of paper. Everybody immediately intuits that she's doing this as a sign of love and affection for the husband that she loved so well in his life. Right? And it's the same thing, even when we see people kissing statues and like they're not kissing the stone and, and anticipating that like some idol that's going to, you know, bring them good luck or something. If, that were, if they were doing it for that reason, that would be really problematic. And if their pastor found out about it, he would have some choice words for them. Right? So that would be one thing. Uh, another thing that you can respond is, well, what do you think of like a crush scene? You know, you're going into a department store and you know, they've got a nice little nativity scene with a reward. You know, sometimes you'll find these with some homes you know. We'll see with the Lord, Our Lady, and St. Joseph, and you know, the shepherds, and the wise men. And you can say, how is this any different than the statues that we have in our church? Right? And then, if none of that works, or maybe even before you do that, depending on who you're talking to, you can actually go back to the Old Testament and see how God himself interpreted this. Because right after the promulgation of the Ten Commandments, Almighty God said to Moses, Okay, you have the commandments, now I'm going to instruct you in all of the liturgy that you're going to observe as people and the way that you're going to worship me. And that is important to God. In the Old Testament, God details out divine worship to the smallest details. You know, the tabernacle is going to be this big and not that big, it's going to be this color, it's going to be these images on it. And then you're going to be at this altar here, and it's going to be exactly this big, and this is exactly what you're going to sacrifice on it. And when. And it's going to be this particular man, and he's going to be wearing these particular clothes. I mean, it's down to those minute details. God is not uncaring about the way that he's worshipped. Not because he needs a particular kind of worship, but because he knows what is best for us in worship and what is going to most incline us to actually give us, get in our hearts. So what happens in the context of all that liturgy? God says, okay, and I want you to build an ark, which is going to be a home to the stone tablets that I've given you with the law on them. And on top of the ark, what did he command Moses to build? Two golden caravans. Two graven images. So if that's an absolute prohibition, thou shalt not make graven images, then God's contradicting himself less than one book in the Bible later. Like right now, go ye and make graven images. And it's not the only time that we even see that. So in numbers, people start murmuring, and because they're murmuring, you know, they're saying, we want to go back to Egypt, and you know, who is this God who's giving us this nasty manna to eat, that we have to eat day after day after day. Um, God's not so happy about that, so he sends these serpents, these venomous serpents that come and they fight the people. And a bunch of people die. And then the people come running to Moses, interesting, to an intercessor, and they say, Oh, go, go, stop this, go pray to God and make it stall. We're sorry. And Moses goes to God and prays for the people, and God says, Make a bronze serpent and essentially set it in a tree. And anyone who comes and looks upon the bronze serpent who is afflicted with the poisons will be healed. Make a graven image. And Christ himself actually refers to that in John chapter 3. He refers to the bronze serpent being lifted up. And he says, I too will be lifted up. And Fulton Sheen makes a big deal of that. 
This is the serpent that looked just like all the other serpents, but he didn't have poison in it. Christ looked like just any other man, but he had no poison in it, no sin. And they both hung on a tree. And they both brought about the healing of the people. This, these types are really important. These foreshadows in the Old Testament. So, so no, we don't want to divide the first commandment into two. It's, it's really, really problematic. You know, you even see Solomon building golden bowls. Like, what did Aaron get in trouble for? Making a golden calf. When Solomon built the temple, outside the temple was this great washing bowl. So the, the altar of sacrifice was actually out in front of the temple. And the priests would go and they would sacrifice the lambs and the goats. And then they would go over to this great washing bowl and they'd wash their hands. And underneath the bowl there were like 28 golden bowls holding the thing up. And God came and he saw the temple and he said, this is very good and blessed it. He didn't say like, it's all good, but what are these golden bowls? I thought we talked about this 500 years ago. No, because he knew that the intent was not a great image for the purpose of worship. Okay. So bear with me over here. Um, I want to talk now about what we call the councils. And the councils are not commandments. That's what we want to be very clear with at the outset. The councils are not commandments. The councils are something that help us, they aid us on the way to perfection. So there are invitations from Christ to observe a more perfect way of life, which will help someone all other things being equal, will help somebody to grow in union with him. And those counsels are, broadly speaking, so there's a, there's a lot of things that are of counsel, but the most major ones are radical poverty. So remember the rich young man. If you wish to be perfect, go and sell everything. If you wish to be perfect, go and sell everything. So radical poverty. Does he say if you want to be saved? No. He says if you want to be perfect. Right? Um, so radical poverty. Obedience. Now obedience is a virtue. So we owe obedience to certain people in our life. We'll talk about some of that as we go along. Um, but the more radical obedience here is a total oblation of the will. So generally when we have obligations of obedience, it's for the common good of some group that a figure of authority has authority over. And we owe obedience for those things that pertain to the common good, common good of that group or organization. Whether it's a family, a parish, a diocese, a nation, a city, whatever. Um, those that embrace the counsel of obedience obey someone for their own personal good. And I'm totally setting aside my will and following your will. Okay, so that's the second, maybe the great counsels we can talk about. The third one is chastity. And here too, we have a virtue of chastity. So it's not a counsel, it's not only a counsel to be chaste. Okay, but this is a more perfect chastity. This is somebody that says, I am going to be perfectly confident for the rest of my life. And that's what we mean by the council of chastity. It's a council that was obviously embraced by our Lord and our Lady themselves. Right? Now there are certain people that don't just resolve to follow these councils, but they, they actually take vows to do so, which means that they promise to Almighty God to observe these councils as, as perfectly as they can. And those people we call religious. Now, we want to distinguish between religious and priests, because priests do have certain vows, but the priests are not necessarily religious, and they don't necessarily take all the vows of religious. So generally, every priest takes a vow of celibacy. Uh, even what we call a secular priest, a non-religious priest. 
So the, the technical term that the church's law has for me, because I'm not a religious priest, I'm not under all of those vows, is a secular non-religious priest, which means a worldly non-religious priest. So you can tell all your friends, come to see Father Curtis, he's worldly and not religious. <laughs> Okay. Um, there are religious priests, so there are priests that in addition to the vow of um, chastity also take vows of obedience and poverty. Okay? And it's just a different way of life. It's a higher way of life than what I live, um, but it's just a different way of life. Generally, parish priests do not take a vow of poverty because a parish priest has to have, in these days particularly, a car, for example. You know, I, I can't get a phone call at midnight from the hospital saying we have somebody's dying and say, okay, very good, can you send me an Uber? You know, I can't do that. I have to have a car so that I can do that. So there's a reason that I don't embrace that particular vow. Um, okay, so then we can talk about religious proper. So we've already talked about religious priests. That's kind of a subclass of religious. You have other men that are religious, but they're not necessarily priests. And you would call those brothers or monks. Sometimes you call them lay brothers. And then in women religious, you have what we call sisters and nuns. Now, this isn't something that is like an absolute division, and if you get it wrong, a nun is going to slap you in the face. Okay. Um, but typically when we're talking about nuns, we're talking about women religious that are cloistered. Meaning they live in a convent and they do not come out in essence of emergency. Sisters are those that have a more active role. So sisters are more engaged in the world. They still have the vows, but they might work as nurses or teachers or you know, any number of different things. Okay. Um, Okay, so that's religious. And there's tons of different religious groups that as you go forward in your Catholic faith, you'll, you'll become more and more familiar with. You know, you'll start to learn who the Benedictines are, who the Dominicans are, who the Franciscans are, and who the Redemptors are. And, you know, there's, at this point, there's hundreds of different religious groups, but there's six or seven really major ones that you'll become accustomed to, and those are the ones that just about every Catholic recognizes. Uh, and then you'll come to some of the, the newer ones or the smaller ones, you know, like the missionaries of charity, or the Teresa started, or you know, the sisters of perpetual adoration, and you know, somewhere in that, right? And, and that's like it's like six of them, and that's the whole group. So they I mean, existed for five years. It's, um, all right, so it's after 9 o'clock here, so next time we'll pick up with uh, the First Commandment, which we've already talked a little bit about the First Commandment in, in relation to going through the Ten Commandments, um, but we'll specify a little bit more and try to read there for lessons 16, 17, 18, and why don't you go ahead and read 19. So I'm hoping that Father Savoy will get through the first four commandments. Uh, the fifth commandment is a lot of bioethics and end of life issues and things like that. So I don't want to talk to you guys about that. But, so, good. Any questions? All right, excellent. I'll give you a lesson.